So I'm Carl Bergstrom. I have the honor of uh, introducing Ruslan Medjikov today. For many, many years, I've thought that one of the most important problems in evolutionary biology is the issue of the evolution of the vertebrate immune system. And yet evolutionary biologists, I think, have been very slow, negligently slow, in sort of taking up this, this challenge. I've even written perspectives trying to get my colleagues in evolution excited about it and gotten essentially zero traction. Um, I think there's a very straightforward, simple reason, and that's that evolution, I mean, immunology is very, very hard. And there's just an enormous amount that one would um, have to learn before one knew enough to even start to make progress. And so I think there have been very few of my evolutionary biology colleagues with the knowledge and the motivation to really dive into this area. We're lucky, though, that there's sort of a, been a handful of really world-class immunologists that have uh, a deep understanding of evolutionary theory and, um, and a deep interest in understanding how the immune system has evolved. And Ruslan, is, Ruslan Medjikov, who's going to be speaking to us, is, is foremost among, um, among these people. I first heard him speak at a Gordon conference in immunology um, nearly 15 years ago. And the story he told there remains uh, one of my favorite stories about uh, of how asking evolutionary questions, kind of, you know, uh, ultimate level um, questions can lead to massive breakthroughs in understanding proximate mechanisms of human biology. Uh, it's a beautiful case of this. And so uh, Ruslan is sort of recognizing at this time the, the, the long-term co-evolution of, um, of mammals and their, and their gut biota. Um, and uh, he came to be interested in, well, you know, given this long-term co-evolution, how has the immune system evolved to uh, tolerate its, its gut flora? And in the process of studying that question, he not only uncovered the mechanisms of immune tolerance that are involved, but he also found that this system had been, you know, another wonderful evolutionary story, that this system of immune tolerance and recognition and tolerance of the gut flora has been co-opted in order to um, play a critical role in the repair of ulcerative le uh, lesions in, uh, in, in the intestine. It's absolutely wonderful work, and I, you know, I think should be sort of one of our case examples when people ask us what, uh, what evolutionary reasoning can contribute to, to medicine. Um, so I don't want to go on and on because I want you to hear Ruslan. I just do want to say uh, you know, who, he, who he is. Ruslan is the Davis W. Wallace Professor of Immunobiology at Yale Medical School. He's a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator. He's a member of the Institute of Medicine and the Natural, National Academy of the Sciences. And I think, you know, most importantly for us, he's here today to tell us about his work. So please join me in uh, welcoming Ruslan Medjitov. We're honored to have him uh, here, and, and I'm excited to hear him address this question, uh, what is a disease? Thank you very much, Carl, for a very generous introduction. And uh, I want to thank Randy, Cynthia, and uh, Charlie for inviting me to be part of this uh, really, uh, really, really exciting meeting. And I've been learning a lot and uh, uh, feel very um, privileged uh, to be here um, today. So um, my um, a focus of my talk today would be uh, about uh, the issue related to um, disease classifications. And uh, I will need to, in the beginning, make a few uh, preliminary sort of points that you, all of you are familiar with much better than me, but I need to make them uh, uh, not to inform you, but to use them as, to build my argument. So uh, please uh, um, uh, bear with me on those points. So the motivation for this uh, question came up uh, while working with Steve on, uh, on the textbook that uh, Steve mentioned this morning. And uh, when we started working on the chapter on uh, diseases with the title, What is a Disease? Um, it would be natural to start a chapter like this with some sort of uh, 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 classification scheme for diseases because all diseases are different. and. They are different not only in terms of their clinical symptoms, but they're vastly different in terms of their uh, fundamental causalities that lead to diseases. And at that point, we realized that there isn't really any uh, uh, disease classification available uh, that we could uh, tell. 
Um, uh, what is available, uh, as you all know, there are various types of uh, divisions of diseases by categories based on organ systems. These are primarily, uh, uh, it's primarily a reflection of um, uh, various practical considerations of uh, treatment as well as of clinical education. And there's nothing wrong with it, but it's, it doesn't serve the function uh, that uh, we were interested in. It doesn't serve as a, as a framework to understand different types of uh, causalities of diseases. And uh, as we all know, diseases are, can be very different in a very fundamental way. For example, common cold is a disease, and uh, you have a common cold, and a few days later you will recover and be back to normal. Uh, Alzheimer or uh, glioblastoma is also diseases, and, uh, and if somebody is diagnosed with those diseases, that uh, uh, can be a death sentence. So what's different fundamentally between uh, common cold on the one hand uh, and many other diseases of that kind versus uh, diseases that uh, in the absence of medical intervention, uh, uh, we don't have any uh, way to recover from. And so that was the motivation for thinking about uh, uh, disease classification. And of course, uh, it's also very relevant for the subject of evolutionary medicine because, uh, well, for obvious reasons, I don't need to elaborate on that. But depending on disease, all sorts of concepts uh, and uh, principles that you all collectively developed in this field, um, the answers would be, and emphasis would be different depending on the types of causalities. So, so this was the reason to start thinking about what would be the, uh, an attempt uh, to develop some sort of a classification scheme. What kind of criteria, what kind of uh, disease attributes would be uh, relevant for this type of uh, uh, framework. And so I'll spend the first uh, half of my talk uh, introducing this, um, or discussing some of the preliminary points that are necessary to, to explain the particular framework that uh, I will present in the second half. So the first point I want to make is that uh, uh, diseases, of course, can be conceptualized as uh, phenotypes, and that highlights uh, the fact that they're uh, products of uh, uh, gene and environment interactions. But they can also be conceptualized uh, as uh, states of the system, of a system being an organism. And, and that highlights a very different point, a point about stability, resilience, and vulnerability. And this uh, little schematic here is uh, intended to illustrate that, that you can think of a health state and you can think of a disease state. And you can think of all sorts of shapes of this line that separates them. There could be a high barrier between them. There could be a shallow barrier. Uh, they could be on different, uh, um, different positions with regards to the health uh, status and so forth. Uh, and the point is that uh, you can transit from health to disease state, and in some cases you can go back, and in some cases you can't. And so one question is, why is that? What is, what is the difference between these types of diseases? This schematic also uh, illustrates uh, in, in implicitly that there is a stability to the systems. There is stability to health state, obviously, and that's what is ensured by various mechanisms of homeostasis, so homeostasis keeps us uh, in a healthy state in, in the face of small perturbations in the environment. And for some disease states, there's also stability. They can uh, become stable, not just in the sense that we cannot recover from them, but uh, they can uh, go into a chronic phase. So the distinction between this, uh, these different characteristics can be uh, uh, roughly described as a distinction between uh, different characteristics of the system, such as robustness and resilience. And I don't mean robustness and resilience in the same way that people in uh, uh, complexity theory uh, use them, because these are used sometimes interchangeably. I will use them in a very specific, uh, uh, with very specific meaning, uh, in very simple, uh, robust robustness being uh, 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 a property of the system that describes, uh, that reflects how much perturbation does it take to push you from one state to another. For example, from health state to disease state. And resilience being uh, how easy you can come back from the uh, alternative state into the initial state, from disease state to healthy state. And depending on whether the system is characterized 
uh, by robustness primarily or by resilience primarily, there are different types of vulnerabilities that lead to a different spectrum of diseases. So a simple example would be a, a bone, uh, which has high robustness. Uh, it's hard to break it, but has low resilience. It's hard to recover from it. Uh, on the other hand, intestinal epithelium is very easy to damage, but it's very easy to, uh, to repair. So it has high resilience. So with that, uh, uh, I, the next point I want to make is that uh, in the absence of intervention, in the absence of medical intervention, uh, a natural protection from diseases uh, uh, can rely on three strategies. And these three strategies is to highlight the distinction, but these are extremes of the spectra. And these are prevention, uh, management, and cure. So in, again, this is in the absence of medical intervention. Some diseases can be prevented, uh, but not cured. And these are the diseases that I mentioned, like neurodegeneration and um, most cancers. Uh, some diseases can be managed but not cured, and this has to do with many chronic diseases, and, uh, including many chronic infections like uh, herpes infection or uh, um, toxoplasma infection or TB. And finally, there are some diseases that can be cured, uh, and uh, we get them very often, uh, and we recover from them. Uh, and they're very hard to prevent completely, uh, and this includes examples of common cold and various types of mild uh, tissue injury. So we can look at this uh, uh, problem, uh, again, schematically, uh, looking at health state and disease state. And you can think about uh, some mechanism protect us by preventing transitioning from health to disease, and some protect us from recovering from disease state to the health state. More generally, you can think of problems as falling into two categories, any kind of problems. Some problems are easier to prevent than to, uh, uh, to repair, and some easier to repair than prevent. For example, uh, a dirty car is a problem, and it's much easier to wash the car than invent something that will prevent car getting dirty. And that would be an example of a problem that's it's easier to, to uh, to repair and recover and cure than to prevent. And, and there are op opposite problems that are uh, easier to uh, prevent than to recover. So that's why we change our car oil, uh, because if engine uh, malfunctioning, it would be much harder to re repair that. It's much easier to prevent that by changing car oil. So roughly, these two strategies correspond to uh, two different uh, classes of traits that we evolve. Uh, uh, the first on the top ones, the ones that prevent the problems, these are what I will uh, uh, explain in the next few slides. That's what I refer to as maintenance mechanisms. And the ones on the bottom, these are defense mechanisms. And here I need to, uh, again, show this slide uh, to uh, not to inform you. This is uh, the ABCs of life history traits. And I've uh, been very fortunate to be uh, uh, at Yale, uh, uh, close to Steve, and uh, learned a lot about uh, the, the really fundamental biology and, uh, of life history traits, how, how fundamental life history is to biology, and got really interested in uh, studying it from a more mechanistic perspective. But the reason I'm showing this slide is, uh, is to highlight this point. A couple of points. The first one is that, as, again, as we all know, there are three main domains of life history traits, growth, reproduction, and maintenance. And if, if I were to ask you what is growth, reproduction, and maintenance, we all have the same answer to growth and reproduction. We all will know what that means. And uh, we know the mechanisms. We know all kinds of pathways involved in controlling growth and reproduction, hormonal pathways, and so on and so forth. We will have the same answer. If I ask you what is maintenance, uh, the answers would be different, um, and there would be no consensus. Uh, and, some, and the answers actually will probably fall into maybe two or three classes of answers, and they will reflect what you're primarily interested in studying uh, in, with regards to uh, life history uh, theory. Uh, so that's the first point, that we don't really have a very good universally agreed on definition of what maintenance is. We all know what it means in general. We, we would recognize one if we see it, but we don't have a, a, a mechanistic de definition the way we do for rep reproduction and growth. And uh, 
The second point is that, uh, again, the very basic idea of life history traits is that they are bound by trade-offs and uh, that the choice between these different domains depend, defined by the quality of the environment and uh, such that unfavorable environment leads to investment in maintenance and favorable in growth and reproduction. And here another point is that uh, uh, what could be referred to as an unoccurring principle in life history is that there's only one way that the environment can be perfect, and there are many ways it could be uh, imperfect, unfavorable, and even hostile. If you think about all the environmental factors and imagine them as dimensions on some universal phase space of environmental factors, uh, there would be maybe one and maybe just a few attractors on that phase space that would be considered to be favorable and healthy. In, in many cases, probably just one. But there would be everything else would be unfavorable. But the point is that it can be unfavorable in many different ways, and depending in what, and depending on which way it's unfavorable, will require very different types of maintenance mechanisms. And uh, so, so this is something that needs to be considered uh, when we think about maintenance in the context of life history theory and maintenance in the context of physiological mechanisms involved. So. Um, one way to think about maintenance uh, is uh, in terms of this triad of homeostasis, uh, maintenance, and defense. And uh, I'll, I'll illustrate one uh, schematic uh, way of uh, visualizing what maintenance is and how it's different from homeostasis and defense and how it's part of the same spectrum. That they're not, they not absolute distinctions between them, but they're parts of the spectrum. So if we think about all the biological, normal biological processes, development, and uh, uh, physiology. Homeostasis uh, encompasses all the mechanisms that enable normal functioning of this process and enables stability of a healthy state. But what's important is that no matter how optimal the performance of all these functions are, no matter how close we are to the perfect, healthy, homeostatic state, uh, there's always some byproduct of biology, and byproducts involve uh, a variety of uh, uh, metabolic and uh, developmental and uh, uh, tissue function deteriorations, malfunction, uh, damage, and so on and so forth. This is in the absence of any kind of hostile environmental impact. This is just a normal part of normal biology. No matter how perfectly you run, uh, uh, how neat your office is, uh, there's always a garbage bag that needs to be taken out. Taking out the garbage is not part of homeostasis. It's a, it's a byproduct of homeostasis, it, and it's a function of maintenance, and that's how I think they're distinguishable. So maintenance mechanisms deal with these byproducts, and uh, hostile environmental factors, things that make things imperfect, they negatively impact on biological processes, and, that, and as a consequence, they contribute to uh, extrinsic mortality, and that's what leads to evolution of defenses that uh, attempt to eliminate these hostile environments. They, they protect us from them. And this particular arrow shown here is the part of defense that is, uh, 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 and the Reed would call uh, the resistance aspect of defense. And, um, uh, the defenses uh, have costs, and they also impact positively on increased production of the, the garbage of life, essentially, uh, just like hostile environmental factors do. And that increases the requirement for maintenance. And that maintenance component is what would be, in that same terminology, uh, would be uh, the tolerance uh, aspect of defense. And uh, uh, the second point is uh, regarding maintenance is that one can distinguish between constitutive maintenance, the one that's involved in continuously taking care of byproducts of normal physiology and development, and uh, inducible maintenance, the one that needs to be upregulated in the face of hostile environments and various conditions that uh, lead to increase in, in this domain. And so again, to, to quickly illustrate the distinction between homeostasis and maintenance, if you think of protein homeostasis within the cell, uh, what the goal of that homeostasis is to maintain the right concentration of proteins. That controls uh, protein synthesis, transcription, protein degradation. But the byproduct of that is occasional protein aggregation. 
And that's taken care of by a very different system that eliminates aggregated proteins. So that's the maintenance mechanisms. So the next point uh, uh, is to, uh, uh, to mention the contribution of uh, extrinsic and intrinsic mortality. We already heard several wonderful talks about this subject, uh, uh, the impact of extrinsic mortality on lifespan uh, and uh, mortality schedules in general. And uh, what I want to, uh, to mention here is that intrinsic mortality uh, is generally due to decline in the maintenance programs, that maintenance programs operate only for as long as it's deemed necessary based on the extrinsic mortality schedules. Um, and this could be uh, schematically illustrated like this. If this is a maximal lifespan for the organism, this is lifespan defined by extrinsic mortality, the maintenance programs would generally operate for the duration of uh, the uh, uh, lifespan defined by extrinsic mortality. And if, if extrinsic mortality is lifted, then we uh, pay the cost of uh, decline in maintenance Trans, uh, uh, which translates into intrinsic mortality in all age-associated diseases. And uh, this would be important, uh, again, you all know about that better than me, but I'm showing it here because that would be necessary to, to make one of the arguments uh, about disease classification. So this, these different schedules of mortality, again, this is, uh, 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 results in different mortality curves and uh, large Animals uh, have the type 1, and humans also in this category, and animals in captivity have type 1 mortality curves. Type 3 mortality curves uh, are very common in nature uh, with very high extrinsic mortality very early on, leading to high fecundity, and type 2 would be in small rodents and uh, many birds. But m all animals in captivity would have uh, type 1 mortality curves as, as far as we know. And uh, so this is something that I would need to, again, to make a point later on. And uh, one final preliminary point uh, is uh, regarding the, uh, the role of phenotype in, uh, I'm sorry, role of the environment and genotype in, uh, in disease uh, risks and uh, disease predisposition susceptibility. And again, this is, of course, this is something that is uh, uh, the, the ABC of uh, evolutionary biology, but the reason I'm putting it here is because uh, these, these concepts, although they're uh, inherently obvious to all of you, they're actually not obvious to uh, everybody, and, 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 uh, and not as much as you would hope uh, they would be uh, trivial to the rest of the biomedical community. I was uh, at one point sitting at a, a, a meeting, of some kind of a board meeting, deciding on uh, allocating large amount of uh, money for funding something related to a particular disease. Uh, and that particular disease has early onset and very strong genetic component. And there was a very long and heated debate about whether it's genetic or environmental. And I thought it was a, a, just a, uh, it was absolutely crazy. That, that, that there would be such debate. Uh, the reason there is such debate is because there are these uh, uh, three dimensions to gen genotype environment interactions in, in terms of their, how, how they map into disease uh, susceptibility. And I thought, that while listening to all that uh, crazy debate, I thought about a, a very simple visual way to, to present that uh, problem so that it's obvious that uh, when we discuss uh, the contribution of genotype versus environment, uh, that the point is that at the extremes, genes uh, can cause disease regardless of the environment, and at the extremes, environments can cause uh, disease regardless of the genotype, and then there is everything in between, and most of it is in between. And this could be schematically illustrated by this kind of a idealized uh, uh, and uh, completely fake uh, a graph that shows uh, the dependence of risk of disease the function of genotype and the function of the environment. If we take any one particular relevant environmental factor and vary it uh, from more favorable to least favorable, uh, and this would be individual points here would be genotypes of individuals in the population, then we would see something like this. There would be this kind of a curve. What this curve illustrates is that at the extremes shown here, this would be rare genetic abnormalities, genetic mutations that are completely undirected and random, resulting in Mendelian diseases, and this would be uh, environment independent. 
And what we have at the bottom here is that even at the uh, most unfavorable environments, some genotypes would be still protected, but if you push it one step further, then uh, it would be incompatible with life. So it's, it's trivial, but there's, there's any, anything in be, everything in between, and you can arrive to disease by different, through different genotypes. And that leads to different specific uh, pathogenesis mechanisms that may be masked by the fact that all of them converge on the same set of symptoms. And that's probably a very common feature for most complex diseases that would be diseases here. Here, the genetics plays a role of predisposition, whereas here, genetics determines in an environment-independent way. But these predispositions can be uh, translated into different mechanisms that happen to converge on the same phenotypes. And then we would uh, have, for any given environment, for any given population, we'll have uh, this disease space or high-risk space and then uh, protected uh, uh, genotypes. Now, so with that, I will just briefly, uh, quickly go through uh, the, the actual categories of diseases that are based on some of this reasoning. The reason I needed to go into these details is because of the seven categories of diseases. Some of them are very obvious and trivial, and some of them I will use this uh, reasoning to explain why they are distinguished as a separate category. So these are the categories. Uh, uh, these include genetic diseases, rare Mendelian genetic uh, uh, disorders, environmental diseases, diseases of defense system, of homeostasis. Many of these are obvious again. Uh, the category five is the least obvious probably, and that's the one that's caused by lack of maintenance, and then diseases caused by stochastic developmental problems as well as uh, uh, different genomic conflicts. So I'll go through this quickly uh, uh, through the one, uh, I will go quickly through the ones that are trivial categories. They, they uh, introduce here for completeness. Uh, and this scheme, scheme doesn't reflect the prevalence of diseases. This is just different categories. Some of them are very rare, some of them are very common, but they have very different uh, types of causalities. And uh, so, so the genetic diseases, uh, uh, again, these are rare, catastrophic, environment independent, and as opposed to genetic predispositions, and this involved all the monogenic diseases that are severe enough to cause environment independent illness, uh, but not severe enough to kill uh, during embryonic development. And they're random, and they can affect almost any aspect of human biology. And, uh, in the absence of medical interventions, they're typically either lethal or incompatible with uh, reproduction. Uh, and the, these gene variants that arise and give rise to these kinds of diseases are eliminated by natural selection and consequently no specific mechanism evolved to protect from them for the most part uh, because of their frequency, low frequency and high, uh, high penetrance. And so many uh, familiar examples of genetic diseases uh, would fall into this category. Uh, I'm not going to read them all. Uh, you're all familiar with them. The second category are environmental diseases. And, uh, and here we have a gradient uh, of the dependence on the genotype because of this phenomenon of gene genetic predisposition. These include all the major environmental uh, uh, problems from infection to starvation to cold, uh, uh, mechanical injury due to predation, uh, exposure to toxins, and so on and so forth. So this, what, what's uh, important about these factors is that they are major causes of extrinsic mortality. And as such, they are major drivers of natural selection. And because of that, specific mechanisms, which are these inducible defense mechanisms, such as immune response for immune system, evolve to protect from these particular types of diseases. Detoxification system, various behavioral defenses, and, and of course, immune defense being a major one. And because these systems evolve to protect from them, uh, most of these diseases, if not severe enough, they can be cured by these specialized mechanisms. So these are the diseases that can be cured because something evolved to cure from them, and it evolved because these are major factors of extrinsic mortality. And so although they can be avoided to some extent, uh, they cannot be completely prevented generally. That's why they're listed as major parts of uh, 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 hostile environmental factors. 
And uh, uh, the third category of diseases are uh, diseases of the defense systems. Uh, and these diseases are the consequences uh, or byproducts uh, of defenses. Uh, these include all sorts of costs of defenses. Um, and uh, they could be either due to excessive, usually due to excessive, and sometimes due to insufficient uh, or malfunctioning defense systems. And, uh, and these are the uh, high cost, high benefit uh, defense mechanisms, uh, and therefore they are particularly sensitive to uh, environmental mismatch. And they reveal uh, this issue that uh, was discussed already here is the conflict between health of individual and uh, versus survival and reproduction. So diseases in this category include, again, many familiar uh, uh, types of pathologies, uh, autoimmune diseases, uh, allergic diseases, uh, IBD, and, and so on and so forth, and, and some uh, uh, behavioral uh, mental disorders as well that are all byproducts uh, or exaggerated expressions uh, of, uh, of defenses. The fourth category uh, is distinguished here because these diseases have very different type of causality. These are diseases of homeostasis and phenotypic plasticity. And these are basically all vulnerabilities exposed by environmental mismatch. And there's been much said about that in the context of developmental plasticity, and uh, we'll hear, uh, I guess, tomorrow from Peter more about that. Uh, but uh, there is a very related and parallel uh, issue related to homeostasis. The homeostasis can also, uh, uh, just like developmental trajectories for some traits, there's only single developmental trajectory. For some, there can be more than one, and the latter ones are subject to developmental plasticity. Similarly, with homeostasis, some homeostatic circuits have only single fixed set point, and some have multiple adjustable set points, and they evolve for exact same reason as we have developmental plasticity, to, to adapt to changing uh, uh, physiological priorities and uh, changing environment. And those systems that have adjustable set points are vulnerable to dysregulation, because these systems already have built-in ability to go into a, 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 a different uh, setting, different set point, like uh, insulin, uh, signaling pathway, for example, leading uh, uh, to um, change in glucose allocation to the fetus uh, during pregnancy uh, or glucose allocation to immune system during infection. But that built-in property to change the set point of insulin system also makes it vulnerable to uh, type 2 diabetes. And these other diseases uh, also fall into, uh, uh, are explained from this similar perspective. Not all systems are vulnerable to disease of homeostasis, only the ones that have adjustable homeostatic set points. The rest of the majority of physiological processes are actually not vulnerable to this type of dysregulation. And so the fifth category is the one that uh, I think is the, uh, uh, the most important in this context. And, and because this, this is the category that I've been struggling with understanding for a long time, uh, when trying to understand uh, the questions such as, did we evolve anything to protect us from cancer? Where the immune system plays a role in protection from cancer, for example, is a question that we have to deal with uh, all the time in, in our uh, field. And so these diseases are actually caused not by any specific insult, not by any particular uh, environmental factor, unlike diseases in the second category, but rather they are caused by uh, absence or age-dependent decline in maintenance mechanisms. That's the part of the lifespan that is uh, exposed by, re by relieving the extrinsic mortality factors. And this is a consequence of antagonistic pleiotropy, and uh, all age-associated diseases would be in this category. These are the diseases that we evolved to prevent, but we didn't evolve to recover from. They're, again, as I mentioned, caused by lifespan extension, and these are the major contributors to intrinsic mortality. That's where we die from uh, if we eliminate everything else. So these, are, these diseases are preventable by maintenance mechanisms. Uh, the problem is that majority of these maintenance mechanisms are not really understood, and they're actually not studied. Homeostasis is studied, defenses are studied. These maintenance mechanisms are not studied as such. The only things that are studied 
they're studied for different reasons. For example, DNA repair is very well studied, and it's one of the maintenance mechanisms, but it's one of maybe dozens of different maintenance mechanisms. And it wasn't studied because people want to understand uh, uh, the life history uh, mechanisms. They were studied for entirely different reasons. So DNA repair is a maintenance mechanism. It's orchestrated by pathways like P53, but these pathways work to prevent cancer. They don't work to cure cancer, because cancer cells would disable these pathways. So this would be an example of a disease that is preventable for the duration of expected lifespan, but not curable naturally. Neurodegeneration presumably would be in the same category, and there it has to do, depending on the type of disease, it could have to do with, for example, decline in protein quality control, uh, autophagy, lysosomal degradation, and so forth. So this category is very big and it's growing and the longer we will live, the, the more of these diseases will show up. Uh, uh, the, there are several large classes of diseases, degenerative diseases, including all the neurodegenerative diseases and many other types of degenerative diseases. And diseases where degeneration is the uh, primary cause but the symptoms are caused by something else. For example, decline in beta cells of the pancreas would be primary cause by type 2 diabetes would be secondary cause. And, and cancer, at least most cancers, not, not infection-induced cancers, but uh, the, the rest of the cancers uh, 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 are also in that category. So the last two categories I'll go through very quickly because they're simple. Ten minutes. Well, I thought I had only one minute. Okay. Uh, I'll go through them quickly anyway. The, the last two categories uh, I, I put here, again, for completeness. There's nothing new I'm going to say about them, and uh, we have experts about those categories here, um, uh, but I'll just mention them. Uh, the category six are diseases caused by stochastic developmental problems. This is basically shit happens category, right? It's not, there is no other reason. These are things that can happen, they can go wrong, and they're too rare and too expensive to fix, and that's why they exist. So these are diseases uh, uh, cause, uh, the, the types of events that fall into this category is the, uh, the, the chromosome segregation, these like various trisomies, uh, all kinds of complications of pregnancies, uh, fetal high drops, uh, and uh, interesting category, uh, uh, diseases of premature delivery, where the timing of the tissues that interface with the environment, primarily lung and the intestine, uh, are, are not ready to, to face the environment, leading to diseases like uh, respiratory distress syndrome and necrotizing enterocolitis. And uh, th so these are consequences of anatomical or developmental trade-offs. Uh, again, these are the just things that can happen and it's too, uh, uh, too costly or too, too complicated to fix them. And, uh, uh, and that's why they can still happen, and they're, they're fortunately uh, sufficiently rare. But uh, um, uh, many of these diseases actually were, may not be aware of because they now are play out due to uh, uh, elimination by this intrauterine filters and oocyte attrition that uh, Steve mentioned uh, earlier. And finally, the seventh category are diseases caused by uh, maternal and fetal uh, conflict and um, and maternal, uh, paternal conflicts. And uh, uh, so the, again, these diseases, again, we have uh, real experts on those diseases here, and uh, the, um, uh, they include uh, fetal growth restriction, uh, preeclampsia, eclampsia, blood group, histone compatibility, gestational diabetes, and uh, as we heard from uh, Crespi and Boomsma, uh, also schizophrenia, autism. And um, so, in summary, um, in the absence of medical intervention, some diseases can be cured by specialized mechanisms. And uh, uh, many diseases, uh, fortunately, in that category, uh, and these diseases we evolved to deal with uh, because they, we've been facing them for uh, a duration of our evolution. And, uh, and they are cured by specialized mechanisms that are parts of inducible defenses. And the second type of diseases, a uh, major category of diseases that will become more and more prominent as uh, lifespan increases and uh, healthcare improves, um, uh, are diseases that are caused by uh, decline in age-dependent decline in maintenance. 
And these are poorly characterized. Uh, they are efficiently prevented uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in younger age, and, uh, uh, but they cannot be naturally cured. And what I want to say, the last point, is that this distinction is not just simply uh, uh, some theoretical uh, construct. Uh, this distinction actually is never really made explicitly in, uh, in clinical science and clinical investigation or in uh, 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 not taking into account when developing treatments. And this distinction is very important because depending on whether disease is in the first or second category, there may or may not be mechanisms that are already in place to take care of the problem. So if for example, uh, the mechanisms already evolved to, to, to deal with the problem. All we need to do is to find the right button to, to push it, and the rest of the system is already there. And the drugs that work really well, they work for that reason. This includes statins and beta blockers. These things, so you don't need to know anything about metabolism or cardiovascular system to have these drugs to work, because all you need to know is to hit the right button. Diseases like cancer or neurodegeneration, unfortunately, there may not be any buttons to push. So there is no natural way to deal with them. There are no wires and mechanisms and so on in place. And with those diseases, what happens is that there is this uh, wishful thinking that there is some buttons and that we can keep pushing uh, them at random and hoping that eventually there would be a cure. Hopefully there will be a cure. I mean, any cure would be good. But, uh, but the point is that for this, that category of diseases, the, perhaps the uh, evolutionary informed strategy would be not to try to find a button that's not there, but to figure out, to learn more about mechanisms of maintenance and to learn how we can promote these mechanisms and maybe reactivate them to prevent these problems from happening. So I'll stop here and thank you very much for your attention. Is the old age is a disease? Uh, is the old age a disease? No, the old age, I don't think, is disease in, uh, in itself. And we know you can be uh, very old and healthy. The age in itself is not a disease. It's a, it's a disease predisposing factor. And uh, depending on the degree of decline in maintenance mechanisms, one may or may not experience diseases in any given age. But as the, late, the, the longer you go, of course, uh, the chances of that decline. Yeah, just a minor addendum to your diseases of maintenance. You mentioned antagonistic pleiotropy, but actually one would think that mutation accumulation would be far more responsible for diseases of maintenance than antagonistic pleiotropy would, simply because there are going to be more neutral alleles that are deleterious in late life than there are alleles which are antagon fall into antagonistic pleiotropy. You mean somatic mutation accumulation or? Uh, germline mutation. Mut germline mutation accumulation. So when Menowar and Williams put forward the original theory, evolutionary theory of senescence, yeah. there were two mechanisms, antagonistic right. pleiotropy and mutation accumulation. And in our fruit fly experiments that demonstrated those, we found more mutation accumulation than antagonistic pleiotropy. I agree. Um, your, your categories are not unique. This means you can easily add one or the other disease to different categories. Right, but, that's, but I think that's the strength of it. Because when you have, I intentionally put examples of the same disease in more than one category. And the reason is to highlight the fact that the same disease could arise due to very different causalities. It's just, it just shares the same symptoms. And again, I mentioned type 2 diabetes. Uh, it's a, it can be age-dependent disease. Uh, but it also can happen if you uh, have, um, you know, eat too much and don't exercise and so on. Uh, but the mechanism leading to that would be different. In one case, you develop in obesity associated type 2 diabetes. It's lipotoxicity and inflammation that leads to it. In age-dependent type 2 diabetes, it's a decline in beta cell pool. 
So mechanistically different, symptomatically similar. And that's why uh, looking at these types of causalities, so even when you take any disease and, and analyze it close enough, you tend to find that there is heterogeneity. And, and I think that's not the limitation. I think that's the strength of the uh, looking at these types of causalities. Great, well thank you all very much. Let's please join me in thanking Ruslan. Thank you.